Welcome back to Reaching New Levels of Faith. My name is Curtis Hartshorn, and this is class 11. We're going to be talking about up again, down again faith. And as I mentioned in the last class, this is a favorite of a lot of people because we can relate so much to this. Uh, sometimes our faith is high and sometimes it's low. And uh, it, it kind of reminds us of a roller coaster. I have up here on the screen a picture of a roller coaster. This is not just any roller coaster. This is the Time Traveler in Silver Dollar City. We're filming this in Oklahoma and we're not very far from Branson, Missouri. And if you go over there, they have this at Silver Dollar City, the Time Traveler. Now this, uh, this is supposed to be one of the five most mind boggling uh, roller coasters in the world. Here's what a review says about it. A spinning masterpiece defies gravity wonderfully. The ride features three inversions, including a vertical loop and two launches for maximum speed. The 100 feet tall ride zooms and spins for the very best adrenaline rush, mimicking a plunge through mountains. Now, there was a time when roller coasters used to be pretty fun for me, but I'm getting to that age that I really am not tempted to go and to ride this thing. It sounds wild to me. Uh, by the way, if you wanted one of these, you can build one in your backyard. It only costs $26 million. That's what it costs to build this thing. I don't like roller coasters. They make me sick. And to be quite honest, I don't like up again, down again faith either for the same reason. I don't like it in myself and I hate to see it in my brothers and sisters. And so I want to show you what the Bible says, and we're going to look at some examples of up again, down again faith, and then I'm going to show you what causes up again, down again faith so that you can avoid that in your life. Everybody has their highs and lows. We're going to have our good days and our bad days. We understand it. But if your faith is way, way up and then way, way down and way up, like I, I remember one time I heard a, a brother explain to me, he says, I don't know what's wrong with me. I mean, there are days when I'm on fire for the Lord, I'm out sharing my faith and I'm reading my Bible and praying and everything's going good. And then I just hit this skid where my faith is just way, way down. Well, there are people in the Bible that actually went through the same thing. In your workbook, if you open up, you will find examples of up again, down again faith. And we're gonna look at that one in Genesis chapter 12 here in just a moment. I hope you can get your Bible open as well. It helps so much if you'll see this in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 12, we're gonna look at the person Abram or Abraham as his name was later changed to. And he was well known for his faith. We actually uh, talked about him before. And Abraham had tremendous faith. In Genesis chapter 12, look with me at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and, I will, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. This is a tremendous example of faith. When you think about what God is asking Abram to do, he's saying, I want you to leave your family, leave the ranch up and go someplace. And he doesn't even really tell him where he's going. He says, I'm going to show you. You just, you just go. That took amazing faith for Abraham to do that. But unfortunately, his, his faith didn't stay high because as he's on this journey, it says in verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came about that when he came near to Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife. See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. By the way, that's a good thing to tell your wife. I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. 
So please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. Now, God never told him to do this. This is not stepping out on faith. He's, he's watching his own skin here. He is just thinking about his own self. And so this faith that started off really, really high, all of a sudden is gone. But it comes back again. Look at chapter 13 and verse 5. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. For we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. If to the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. That was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now here's another great example of faith by Abram because when he has this strife between his herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot, he says, Lot says, you choose whatever you want and if you go this way, I'll go that way. And if you go that way, I'll go this way. That was actually stepping out on faith because in chapter 12, God had actually promised him all the land. And so he is walking by faith. He's really trusting that God is going to take care of him. And he said, Lot, you choose what you want. Lot walked by sight. We're not supposed to walk by sight. We're supposed to walk by faith. And that's exactly what Abram did. And his faith was high again. But unfortunately, it didn't stay that way. In chapter 16, we read of a, an example where Abram's faith really wasn't all that great. In chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to his wife Sarai. And after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she was, had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And things just spiraled down from there. Now again, where, where is God's command to do this? This was not God's plan. They're walking by sight again, and Abram is not walking by faith. And so we see this example in Abram. Sometimes his faith was high and sometimes it was low. He had up again, down again faith. Now this is the book of Genesis. When we turn to the next book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, we see another example of up again, down again faith. But this time we're not going to look at a person. We're actually going to look at an entire nation the nation of Israel. Israel was a nation, as a whole nation. They had up again, down again faith. We know the story of Exodus and how God had commanded Moses to lead the people out of Egypt where they had been in slavery. Let's jump in in chapter 12 of Exodus and look at verse 37. It says, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth about six hundred thousand men on foot, aside from children. A fixed multitude also went up with them along with flocks and herds 
a very large number of livestock. They baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leavened, since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. This large throng of people, it mentions 600,000 men. That's not counting the women and children. It mentions in verse 38, another mixed multitude who went with them. We're looking at 2 million people here conservatively. And they leave Egypt, they step out on faith where they had lived for 430 years and they trusted God. They walked by faith and their faith was at a high until we get to chapter 14 and verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they became very frightened So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way? Bring us out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. What happened to their faith? Where's this great throng of people? It says, the Lord has answered our prayers. He's delivered us from slavery. And they get out there and they're again walking by sight. They see the Egyptian army and they are scared. They're frightened. They say, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? Up again and then down again. Now their faith comes up again. We know what happens next as Moses parts the sea. Look at verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. And the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right, at hand and on their left. Now the Israelites walk through this sea and you think that didn't take faith. Just picture that. You're walking through the sea. There's a wall of water on your left and there's a wall of water on the right and you're walking through the midst of this. That took great faith on their part. Did their faith last? Look at chapter 15 and verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea And they went out into the wilderness ashore, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And so you see this pattern with the Israelites. Up again, down again. Up again, down down again with their faith. Let me show you another example. Look at the book of 1 Kings and let's look at Elijah. And I have a rather lengthy reading here, but I want to read this together because uh, there's just no improvement on the way that the Bible describes the scene here as Moses, or as Elijah, excuse me, takes on the 450 prophets of Baal. We'll start in verse 22 of 1 Kings chapter 18. It says, Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one of the ox for themselves, and cut it up, and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox, and lay it on the wood, and I will put no fire under it. Then you call the name of the Lord your God, I'll call the name of the Lord, And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And the people said, that's a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox, which was given to them, and they prepared it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, oh, Baal, answer us. 
But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. Now it came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is God. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. Then midday was past. They raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. You get that? They're at this all day long. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he prepared the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. He's just showing off now. Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar and also filled the trench with the water. And Elijah said, stand back. No, he didn't really say that. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I inserted that into the text. That's not in the Bible. Please excuse me. But I'll bet he was thinking the same thing. Time to stand back. Verse 36 says, At that time of the altar of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on the ground on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. What an incredible victory. What a, an amazing act of faith. Elijah takes on these prophets of Baal in a, in a showdown, a, a sacrifice showdown, and, and literally beats the fire out of them. I mean, he is so victorious. And his faith is way, way up high at this point. But look what happens in the next chapter. Now Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. That's talking about the prophets of Baal. Then Elijah sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and he rose and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servants there for he himself, went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and he sat down at the juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. He said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And he lay down and he slept under the juniper tree, and behold, the angel uh, touching him, and he said, arise and eat. So here he takes on the prophets of Baal, great victory, tremendous faith, and in the next chapter, he is scared of a woman named Jezebel. Up again, down again. We see it in Abraham. We see it in the nation of Israel. Now we've seen it in Elijah. I want to show you one example in the New Testament. If you'll turn to the book of John. John the baptizer, the one who prepared the way for Jesus. We know that he was a man of amazing faith. And he believed very strongly 
in the cause, the cause of the coming Messiah, who was Jesus. In John chapter 1, we read in verse 29, says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now this is John, the baptizer, talking about Jesus. This is the one on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, and he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. John, as he's walking and his disciples are with him, and the whole purpose of John the baptizer is to prepare the way for Jesus. And so he's been talking to the disciples, the Messiah is coming, we need to be ready. As soon as he sees Jesus, he says, there he is. There's the Lamb of God. Follow him. I'm sure that's the Lamb of God. The one who sent me, and that would be God, the one who sent me told me, when you see the Spirit descend on one, that's the one. And John says, I baptized him. I saw the Spirit descend on him. That's him. There's no doubt in my mind, this is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. This is Jesus. There's no doubt about his, in his mind at the beginning of his ministry. But in Matthew chapter 11, and even though we're turning to the left in our Bibles, we're actually turning forward in time because we're going from the beginning of John's ministry to the end when he is in prison and actually his life is about to end. Look what happens in chapter 11, verse 1. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to the 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the work of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to him, Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? John, what happened? You had this great faith. There was no doubt in your mind. And now you're asking, are, are you the expected one? Are you the one, Jesus? Up again, down again faith. We see it in the Bible. We see it in our own lives. It is so difficult to go through up again, down again faith. And I don't want to see it in your life. And so I want to talk to you about some things that cause up again, down again faith so that this doesn't happen to you. The first one that, that happens to us is setting ourselves up for disappointment. In that passage we read earlier in Mark chapter 9, and uh, since we read this whole thing just in the last class, I'm not going to read all of it. You remember what happened, the story after Jesus was up on the, the, the Mount of Transfiguration and he came down and the boy needed his son healed and the disciples were not able to heal the son. And uh, this is the passage in verse 22, Mark chapter 9, verse 22, where it says, it has thrown him into the, both into the fire and into the water. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And verse 24, immediately the father cried out and he said, I do believe, help my unbelief. Verse 25, Jesus heals the boy. Verse 6 says, after crying out and throwing him into terrifying convulsion, it came about that the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them thought he was dead, but Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. And when he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately, why could we not drive it out? Sometimes our faith is up again, down again, because we set ourselves up for disappointment. We do this to ourselves. We have these false expectations. First of all, we may have a false expectation about ourselves. When you think about it, the disciples had a false expectation of themselves. Jesus is gone. He's up on the Mount of Transfiguration. This boy is brought to them, and they're asked to heal, and they thought, yeah, we can do this. 
We've seen Jesus do this many times. There's no reason we can't do it. They had a false expectation of themselves. They set themselves up for disappointment. The, the father had a false expectation of others. He fully believed that they could do it. And when the disciples could not do this, then he was disappointed. He set himself up for a disappointment. And sometimes we have a false expectation of God. We think God is obligated to do something for us and, and it doesn't happen. And then we're disappointed with him. And, and I uh, mentioned in the last class about prayer. And sometimes we have this false expectation of prayer that God is like a genie. He's just obligated to do exactly what we tell him to do when we're praying. And that's not the way prayer works. When you set yourself up for disappointment, your faith is going to be up and then it's going to plummet. It's going to be up and down. And you're causing this yourself because you have false expectations of yourself, of others, or of God. You need to be realistic about what you can do, about what others can do, and what God is obligated to do. Second way that we cause up again down in faith is by not having our doubts removed through perseverance. James tells us in James chapter 1, there's a, there's a perseverance that we go through when we have trials that helps our faith to remove the doubts so that our faith is stronger. He says it this way in James chapter 1 verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect. Uh, the word here is mature. Incomplete, a word that means to be whole, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." There's a process. He says, whenever we go through a trial, we can consider it a joy because our trial is going to produce in us an endurance and endurance has this perfect result. It brings us to maturity. But he says in verse four, you have to let endurance do that. That implies that sometimes we don't let endurance do that. We look for the easy way out and we don't go through this, this trial with the confidence that God is going to guide us. And as a result, we don't get those doubts removed through the perseverance, through that experience. And because of that, our faith is up and it's down and it's up and it's down. Again, we're causing this. We're doing this to ourselves. There's a third thing that causes up again, down again faith, and that is surface obedience. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 13, I'll show you what I mean by that. Sometimes we obey God, but only on the surface. We really deep down are not trusting God the way that we should. In Jesus' parable of the sower, he tells the parable early in the chapter. We'll not read that. We'll just read his explanation and we'll start in verse 20. The one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but he's only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. You know, when you plant seeds in the ground, you have to make sure you get the rocks out of the soil or else the root will grow down until it hits that rock and it will grow no further. Well, what does the rock represent? We're really not told in the parable, but the rock can represent sin. Sometimes we don't get the sin out of our lives. Or sometimes it's just a doubt, something that we, we have, we're not trusting God in. And so we give God this surface obedience. Yeah, I'm hanging in there, but then a little trial, a little tough time comes along with a, oh, well, wow, I'm not sure I want to do this whole Christianity thing. Surface obedience, not really allowing God's word to dig deeply into our lives and get rooted in our faith the way that God wants it to. That will cause up again, down again faith. Fourth and final thing here is distractions. Sometimes we get distracted. This is actually in the next verse. Look at verse 22. 
And the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of will choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You ever seen a Christian? He's, he's doing good and he is uh, uh, strong in his faith. His faith is growing. He's very active in the church. Uh, he's sharing his faith. He's reading the Bible. He's uh, praying but he kind of gets caught up in the things of the world. He mentions here in this verse, the worry of the world. What's the worry of the world? Oh, I've got to take care of this. And oh, I've got to do a better job at work. And maybe I should work some extra hours, you know. And, and we get so caught up in the worries of this world. And the deceitfulness of wealth, he mentions. What's deceit? Deceit is a lie. What is the deceitfulness of wealth? Wealth tells us that it will solve our problems. If you just had enough money, if you just had this much more money, that would solve all your problems. That's a lie. That's Satan's lie. Satan tries to derail us by leading our minds down two tracks going in a different direction. In other words, if, if you're going on the right way, if, if you're headed this way, and if Satan can get you to look this way, think about a train, it, it can't go both ways and it derails the train. Same thing happens with our faith. Our faith gets derailed because we lose our sight. We, we get our mind off of this. We just read in James, he says, watch out for being double-minded. It's okay to have a one-track mind as long as you're on the right track, right? When we get double-minded and we're thinking about two different things, that's what causes our faith, which could be way up here, to dive and be way down here. Up again, down again, up again, down again. This is what happens with our faith. You can stop that. And as I mentioned earlier, we all have our good days and our bad days, but you can stop the, the crazy roller coaster stuff just by making sure that you avoid those four things that I just showed you that can derail and cause your faith to go into a skit. We talked a little bit about Abraham in this class. I want to devote an entire class to him because Abraham is known as the father of our faith. He's very famous for his faith. But what was so great about the faith of Abraham? We've got a lot more to learn. I want to remind you, keep your motivation. Remember in class number one, we talked about being motivated to grow in your faith. Keep that motivation. Still more to learn. Hope that you will come back and join us for class number 12.